Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. For almost 20 years, we've been bringing leading health experts to your doorstep. It used to be in person, but now every week on Zoom and uh, to bring you health information so you can continue on your path toward optimal wellness. You can uh, start your health journey and you can bring these uh, issues to your clinicians and uh, help educate others. Well, today we have Ray Griffins, who's written a couple of books. Very interesting gentleman. Um, he is a master's in science and is a registered nutritionist and lecturer, hails from the south of England, living in a 16th century cottage on the borders of Essex and Suffolk. Boy, does that sound great. He's been mm -hmm. researching and practicing nutrition for over 20 years and lecturing for over 10. His master's dissertation was in a role that mitochondria play in Parkinson's disease. His lectures and webinars have covered diverse subjects such as cancer and nutrition, chronic fatigue, cardiovascular health, neurodegeneration, multiple sclerosis, and aging. He's got a background in broadcast engineering and likes to apply a similar style systems philosophy to nutrition and biochemistry. He uses his approach to challenge and greatly expand the existing ideas and concepts. Depression, the mind-body diet and lifestyle connection. Uh, you know, 35 million people currently are suffering from depression, et cetera. He has researched heavily on that. Uh, he's researched heavily on other topics. And we welcome Ray today um, to uh, share his wisdom with us. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be, great to be here over in the, the UK. I hope it's... Uh... It's good over where you are. Um, and yeah, thanks for that lovely introduction, Susan. And I'll just share my screen if that's okay and get on with the presentation. Um, I hope to talk for about uh, an hour and a half with this presentation and then there'll be uh, questions afterwards if that's okay. So just put your questions in the chat and um, we'll filter through and um, sort out some of the questions afterwards. So the topic of this evening, or for, for you this morning, but for me this evening over here, uh, it's the brain and neurotrophins. I don't know whether you've heard of them, but they're amazing um, proteins that the, the brain and the body make. And I call them the brain nourishers. So let's get on to the next slide. So the neurotrophin family include brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that's BDNF, and nerve growth factor, that's NGF. And if you look at the name neurotrophin, neuro for brain, nervous system, trophin means nourisher. Now you may have heard that, uh, you may have heard the term atrophy, which is to waste away, become emaciated, shrivel or shrink. You may have heard of that term, muscle atrophy. Well, we don't often use the term trophic, which is pertaining to food or nourishment. That's the opposite, it's the building up. And in depression, there's this atrophy of part of the brain, particularly the hippocampus. In the, in the, it's a structure in the sense of the brain and it's a seahorse shaped structure. Um, and it's named the hippocampus after the Greek name for seahorse. And I love that imagery of this, uh, this vulnerable seahorse in the center of our brain. That we have to take care of to protect our mental health. And these neurotrophins help protect it. So what can we do to try to help these neurotrophins? These neurotrophins like BDNF and NGF, they're really important for the brain, particularly the human brain, because the human brain, brain is unusually large. It's tripled in size from early primates and other, other animals, it's become six times larger than you'd expect for a mammal of our size. Um, so we're, we're actually three times larger than the nearest primate, which are, it's actually gorillas and orangutans are the ones that are the nearest primate to us. Chimpanzees, even though in this diagram, it says it's slightly bigger, they're actually smaller. So we're nearer to the size of the brain of the orangutan and the gorilla, but even those are third the size of our brain. And so being, uh, being these animals which have such large brains, we need a huge amount of energy to keep them working and to keep our mental health on an even keel. So humans have around 86 billion neurons and rodents have between 36 and 850 million and apes and monkeys 
have between one and 30 billion. So we're out on our own with the size of our brain and the amount of energy it requires. Um, so it, some of you may have heard of mitochondria. Well, mitochondria evolved about a billion and a half years ago and the brain heavily relies on mitochondria for most of its energy. So you could say it's taken about a billion and a half years of mitochondrial evolution to allow the human brain to get to where it is today. So it's something we should really nurture and nourish and take care of throughout our life because it needs so much care. We tend to take it uh, for granted to health the brain. In comparison with that one and a half billion years, the first life on Earth was about four billion years ago. Age of our planet, four and a half billion. And the Big Bang was about 13.7 billion years ago. To get an idea of how much energy our brain needs, just the cortical neurons in the human brain, the mitochondria that power uh, these cortical neurons and all our neurons require 4.7 billion ATP molecules per second. And that's when the brain's at rest. So just think when you're really pushing your brain hard, how much energy it needs. And we need to have that energy to keep the brain, as I said, on this balanced, even keel so it can help us maintain our moods and um, protect us from depression and neurodegeneration in later life. The um, proportion of whole body energy that the brain needs. So in rodents, only 2% of whole body energy goes to the brain, their brain. Non-human primates, it's around 10%, between nine and 12%. But humans, 20% of the whole body energy has to go to the brain because it is so resource hungry. If you look at the, uh, this, this is, a, I think this is an amazing statistic. When you look at the, um, the length of our neurons when you lay them end to end. It's about 230,000 miles from the Earth to the moon. It gets closer and it gets further away, but it's almost double to triple the um, length when you lay our neurons end to end. It's about triple that distance, double to triple that distance that our neurons have when you lay them end to end. We need to get nourishment down the axons to the synapses and dendrites. We need to get energy up and down those uh, neurons to make those synaptic connections. So it's, a, it's, a, it's literally something on a galactic scale that our brain has to be dealing with every single second. We're, we're dealing with sizes that are as big as, as the, <clears throat> As, as our galaxy effectively, I mean, if you take into account all the peripheral nerves on top, then that would probably reach to Mars and back. So we're just massively um, resource hungry for our whole nervous system. I, I hope I've got that across, just what a big feat it is to keep our body and our nervous system nourished. And I hope I'm not exaggerating, but I don't think I am at all. Um, so the neuro, these neurotrophins need to be these managers of the energy of the nutrients that direct the flow of food and nourishment into our brain and nervous system. And without these neurotrophins, our brain would atrophy or shrink and our nervous system would really struggle. So keeping on this idea, it's this theme of space, uh, I liken the the feats of getting energy and resources up to our synapses and the waste products back down again and the signals requesting for more supplies, uh, I'd liken this to like the space shuttle going up into space, up to a space station or going to the moon or even Mars, and then coming back down to Earth again. The movement up to the synapses is called anterograde, anterograde signaling or anterograde motion if mitochondria are moving up, and it's retrograde if it's coming back down again. And this retrograde motion is great for removing waste products, but also the retrograde signaling needs to allow the uh, synapses, what's going on at the synapse to report back to our DNA to say, we need more supplies, we need more help, we need more resources. So there's this really wonderful dialogue in neurons in our brain going over these vast distances to keep this communication going. And it's probably more complicated than it is to send something up into space. But, but the brain has had a billion and a half years to work it out. 
going into space, we've only had less than 100 years. So it's an incredible feat of nature and evolution to keep our brain functioning. And we really need to respect it. These neurotrophins, they can act like magnets to mitochondria, these energy providing uh, organelles, or I, I call them Duracell power packs. They, they're these little, what used to be bacteria that supply energy to our brain, our neurons, to our whole body. And the, as I said, the brain is almost completely reliant on these mitochondria to give us our ATP, our energy. So moving on to theories of depression. So now I've given you the background of these neurotrophins and just what uh, a huge feat of evolution it is and nature to keep our brain powered. Let's have a look at depression when things go wrong. Well, the most of you probably heard of the monoamine hypothesis of depression. And this, is, this suggests that depression is a, an illness caused by a deficit in the neurotransmitters um, and particularly serotonin. So serotonin in particular is uh, behind this hypothesis of the monoamine hypothesis of depression. And, and the idea is that depression could be reversed uh, by antidepressants that promote the increase of serotonin at the synapses in, in, our, in our neurons. Um, and that, that's it's been quite a, a good theory. But Ray, we're getting some interference uh, on the on the audio track. In it because people started to realise that well, hang on, my internet seems to have gone. Yeah, it's. I think it's. Is that better? Should I start again? Um, just back up um, one presentation item. Okay, the the mono. I'm sorry about this. It, this, this doesn't normally happen. Uh, the monoamine hypothesis of depression suggests that there's um, a deficiency or deficit in neurotransmitters and serotonin in particular. And the idea with this hypothesis is that depression can be reversed by antidepressants that pr promotes the increase of serotonin at the synapse. However, people started to realize that antidepressant medication um, took a few weeks to have an effect. Now, why was that? If serotonin levels increased um, quite quickly, why did it take a few weeks? And what they started to realize, what the research started to realize was that antidepressant medication was actually operating via neurotrophins like BDNF, that it was the increases in BDNF that serotonin was, was uh, increasing and that was helping to improve the structural integrity of the brain. And this improvement of structural integrity with these SSRIs was what was leading to the increased feelings of uh, improved mental well-being. So it's a slightly different way of seeing it. It's not just the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is actually signaling to help improve the integrity of the brain via BDNF. And that's, that's, I think that's quite an exciting shift in perception. So neuroprotective factors like BDNF have been linked, now being linked to the efficacy or efficiency, effectiveness of SSRIs. Um, Ray? In fact, some of these SSRIs uh, have Ray, been suggested um, to directly is Ray, it breaking, breaking up again, again. um let can okay. we try having you turn off your camera yeah and see if we can just pick up your voice um with okay. your slides i'm so sorry about this so do i do i stop video or what do i do oh camera that's it yeah just click on the stop video um icon and we'll just see okay. if that if that helps the audio track quality. Okay. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, can, is that better, the audio now? So far. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So should I start the that slide again? Uh, we heard most of it. Okay. Let's finish it. Um, no, that's fine. No, it's just the idea that BDNF um, 
which can help with the structural integrity of the brain and help protect against depression, um, SSRIs are now thought to be able to dock directly into the receptor for BDNF. And so, but we're going to try and move to understand what diet and lifestyles can do the same thing. Perfect. So that brings us on to um, the neurotrophic hypothesis of depression. So trying to move away um, from just the monoamine hypothesis, we want to be a little bit more subtle about it, more nuanced about the theories of depression. And the neurotrophic hypothesis of depression, it, it relates to the hippocampus, this inner seahorse that um, shrinks um, when we suffer from depression or excessive stress. And the, the hippocampus amazingly has the ability to regrow neurons. It can regrow itself. And the neurotrophic hypothesis is that um, the ability to regrow the hippocampus and protect us from depression is somehow compromised. So the neurotrophic hypothesis suggests that a deficiency of BDNF rather than purely serotonin could be the main driver of depressive disorders. Um, so is the, is the sound okay now? Is that, is that better? Is that clearer? Yeah, good. Um, so the, the, there's another theory of depression. I mean, all the theories of depression overlap. None of them are completely different. The neurotrophic one, um, it, it, this is the neurogenic one. Um, this is, this one again relates to the uh, hippocampal size and hippocampal volume and um, it, again overlaps with the last one and it enables, again, we're concentrating on regrowing the hippocampus through neurogenesis and it's this structural impairment can also be seen as a vulnerability marker for the development of future depressive episodes and by contrast, a larger hippocampal size could be seen as a biological marker of resilience to depression. So I've got a nice picture of a seahorse in the corner here. And I love this imagery of the seahorse, this vulnerability at the center of our brain. And as I said before, the hippocampus is the, uh, it's the Greek word for seahorse. Hippocampus is the Greek word for seahorse. And it has this curly shape that represents the, the seahorse. And I, and I love that. And when we're suffering with uh, with stresses and there's an increased risk of depression. Just think of that vulnerable seahorse and how to try and rebuild it. Um, another theory of depression is the neuroplasticity theory of depression. Again, as I said, they all, all interlink. This one is looking about the neural connections, how these neurons are continually forming, eliminating and strengthening the connections in response to the continual flow of information. So what's going on in our outer world um, needs to be represented in our inner world, in our brain, in, in, our, in our inner being. We need to have the representation within our brain uh, so it represents what's going on outside of us. And if we can't make these connections inside our brain to mirror what's going on in the outer world, then we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle to cope with the world. So it's therefore not surprising that dysregulation or disruption of this plasticity is associated with neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we need to have a model inside our brain that represents the outer world. And we need all the nutrients to be able to cope with that too. So the neurogenic theory of uh, depression, so the neurogenesis theory um, and the neuroplasticity theory, they overlap that this, this neurogenic theory, this neurogenesis that we can grow new hippocampal neurons is included in the neuroplasticity theory. And this diagram shows you how it all uh, interrelates. You can see uh, at the top of the diagram that there's uh, serotonin decreasing, uh, there's increased stress, cortisol, and this leads to an increased risk of depression and BDNF drops. And when BDNF drops, there's a, the brain struggles to make these new neural connections through neuroplasticity. It struggles to make new hippocampal neurons. And this can lead to um, depression, increased risk, risk of depression. 
The bottom of the diagram, you can see it's got listed antidepressant treatments, which can raise serotonin and raise BDNF and help protect against depression. Um, this diagram may be referring to drugs, but for me, the antidepressant treatments that I want to talk about are about diet, about nutrition, lifestyle, social connections, environment. All these things can raise BDNF and we'll uh, explain this one by one as we go through. So adult hippocampal neurogenesis is really exciting. Um, we have this part of our brain that protects us from depression and um, Amazingly, it can regrow cells every single day to protect us from depression. And there's 700 neural stem cells produced every single day, 700 cells ready to help support our hippocampus, ready to protect our mood. And these neural stem cells have to be given the right environment. They have to be given the right nourishment. So I, I liken this, this transition from these stem cells to adult hippocampal neurons to protect our mental health. I liken it to this transition. I liken it to baby turtles when they hatch on the beach. Their, their first few minutes of life uh, are the most dangerous time in their life. They get uh, eaten up by, gobbled up by predators that swoop down and eat them. So we have to make sure that the predators for our hippocampal neurons have to be taken care of too. So these hippocampal neurons that go from a stem cell to an adult hippocampal neuron to protect us against depression, we have to try and avoid stress, poor diet, inflammation, lack of exercise, urban living, just try and get out in the, in the country a bit more and mitochondrial dysfunction. And we try and address as much as this in the presentation as we can. So this, these 700 cells that are produced every day to help protect our mental health, they need to be looked after. We need to avoid the predators such as stress and poor diet, lack of exercise. They need lots of help. And BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the neurotrophin is really important in this process. If you look on the left-hand side of the diagram, there's NSCs, these are neural stem cells. These neural stem cells, they rely on anaerobic respiration. They, they make energy without oxygen, which is glycolysis. Um, they don't need mitochondria, but to become adult neurons, they need mitochondria. They have to shift towards mitochondrial energy, which is known as oxidative phosphorylation. And this process takes about four days to get from the stem cell to the adult neuron. And we have to make sure mitochondria are fed and providing sufficient energy to make this process. So if someone's stressed or eating badly, then those stem cells are never going to make it to an adult hippocampal neuron. So without functioning mitochondria, which I keep going on about these little power packs within our neurons and our whole body, um, an intermediate progenitor cell, that's the is these cells that are halfway between stem cell and adult hippocampal neuron, they will only survive a few days or four days before they die. They need to have mitochondrial energy. They will never make it across the transition to the adult hippocampal neuron. So just imagine those little baby turtles scurrying along the beach trying to get to the ocean. And that's the same for us stem cells. If we're eating badly, not exercising, if we're completely not motivated or bored with our life as well, that makes an impact as well because BDNF is, is made in higher amounts when we're inspired, we're motivated, we love what we're doing. So we have to make sure we do things that we really love doing and we're around people we like being, being around and not around people that really pull us down. Taurine and neurogenesis. Taurine is a, an amino acid which helps with this transition. It can help neurogenesis, these, this transition to these adult hippocampal neurons. Taurine was able to significantly raise the number of neural stem cells and the progenitor cells helping support neurogenesis. Also three other nutrients, citicoline, which you may have heard of. It's also, it's known as CDP choline, but the trade name is citicoline without an H. Uh, DHA, the omega-3 fatty acid, and uridine, the, the nucleoside uridine. This can support synapse formation and mitochondrial function. 
So BDNF can help with all this. It can help with synapse formation, but it needs the right nutrients. It needs the energy. So it can give the signal to make more neural connections. It can help make the signals, but it needs the right nutrition. If we're not eating right, then we can't make those connections. Um, and citicoline is a precursor to the phospholipids, which help make the cell membranes for, uh, for our neurons and the synaptic connections. And interestingly, uridine, the nucleoside uridine, it can switch our DNA, it can, sell, it can tell our DNA to make the gene expression to make synaptic proteins. It's, it's wonderful how everything comes together. Food source sources of uridine, that nucleoside uridine, which we need for our synaptic connections and our phospholipids. Um, Sugarcane extract, tomatoes, brewer's yeast. Um, brewer's yeast is um, 1.7% uridine by dry weight. So it's, a, it's an important source of uridine. Beer, because it has brewer's yeast in it. I'm not saying go out and drink beer, lots and lots of beer. <laughs> you could do. I mean, it, beer's got hops in it as well, which, which is great. Um, but I'm not, used, I'm not saying drink lots of beer, but it's, it's high in brewer's yeast. There's plenty of other things you can get brewer's yeast from, but it's just interesting that beer's got a lot of uridine in it. Broccoli, offal, so liver and kidneys and uh, walnuts. But the beer was found to almost double blood uridine levels. So um, that's interesting. So uh, BDNF, so this, this idea, this, this knowledge that the brain is extremely energy hungry. It's like a sponge for energy in, in our body. And so we have to make sure that the brain gets the energy where it is needed. We can't waste energy in the brain. And as I said, uh, a brain that is bored and unmotivated is not going to get any energy. BDNF will say, I'm not going to give you any energy because you're not asking for it. So therefore, I'm going to switch off energy in your brain because you just don't want it. And you're going to feel exhausted because the brain needs to be motivated, it needs to be inspired. And if you're doing things that you hate doing, it's not gonna get the energy. So the brain is at the limit of its ability to produce energy. And so they only give energy where it's needed. Interestingly, uh, BDNF improves the efficiency of mitochondria and, and assists in making new mitochondria. And when BDNF is activated, it can even make mitochondria become more efficient. In animal models, they found it became 64% more efficient um, in part of, part of the mitochondria at the beginning of the mitochondria. You may have heard of the electron transport chain. That becomes 64% more efficient in making energy when exposed to BDNF. The neurotransmitters GABA and glutamate double up as mitochondrial fuels. So these neurotransmitters, which are excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters, it's amazing when, when they've done their job in sending a signal to the brain, they're then digested and used as energy in mitochondria and then detoxified in that way. So I, I liken it to if you have a meal that you uh, have your meal and then you eat the plates and knives and forks to save washing up. This is exactly what we're doing in the brain with GABA and glutamate. They're being used as energy once they finish doing their job. And when you consider those distances that things, that, that chemicals and waste products have to travel in our neurons, it, it can save an awful lot of energy by using these waste materials as an energy source. We can also increase BDNF by exercise, calorie restriction and cognitive stimulation, um, which we'll come on to later. And that cognitive stimulation is incredibly important. As I said, if you're not cognitively stimulated, then your brain will really struggle for energy. BDNF is essential for the maintenance of our neurological health throughout life. On the right hand side of this diagram, can you see that an enriched environment, so a motivated, nurtured, a novel environment with lots to occupy our mind, lots of exercise, social interactions, these can, these can all act as antidepressants and improve our neuro, neuronal activity, improve neurogenesis, improve differentiation of these hippocampal neurons, help them survive longer and help with these uh, synaptic connections that we need to be able to adapt to our lives. And this increase, this it helps increase BDNF and BDNF helps increase our, our mental well-being. On the left-hand side, 
we can see that the opposite is true. There's an increased risk of depression when there's excessive stress, when there's maternal deprivation during our formative years. And it's not just maternal deprivation, it's also a lack of support for that child, say in school, in their formative years, maybe they're being attacked by their friends for, for something, I don't know, the uh, color of their jumper or something like that, for the color of their clothes or their choices. Children can be really, really mean. And this can have a really negative effect on a child as they get into adult life lack of activity um, and lack of motivation and neural activity can all lead to an increased risk of depression and apoptosis, the death of neurons and the wasting away of the hippocampus. So it's important that our formative years have this support and stimulation for the brain and we try to be really considerate and loving and caring of our, our younger people um, and, and not um, Put them in harm's way. BDNF can be induced by dietary compounds, as I said, environmental enrichment, social enrichment, yoga, meditation, dance, music, cultural excursions, just going to museums and theatres, particularly as we get older, um, singing, just sing your heart out, sing your heart out, that would be great for your brain, um, and the gut-brain axis as well. Uh, that's, that's something that we're starting to become more aware of, that the connection between, a healthy connection between the gut and the brain uh, is so, so important for, for mental well-being. So um, BDNF and uh, NGF, so brain-derived neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor have receptors. So uh, we want to have the right nutrition which can support those receptors. And I've said before that serotonin um, acting at serotonin itself or SSRIs can support the uh, BDNF receptor. Um, and this is considered one of the main ways in which antidepressants, whether it's diet or drugs, can help support people with their mental health. So BDNF works through a receptor called TRAC B, um, and uh, TRAC stands for tropomyosin receptor kinase. So it's TRAC B, and nerve growth factor works through a receptor called TRAC A. And there's lots of nutrition which can trigger these receptors as well. I'm going to come on to that. So TRAC B, we can use nutrients to trigger BDNF, we can push BDNF in, in ways we're coming too soon, but we can also use nutrients to mimic um, BDNF in its receptor and nutrients within the Mediterranean diet, pomegranate, raspberry, strawberry, walnuts, blackberry, pecan and cranberry. Um, these can all, all mimic the track B receptor, omega-3 fatty acids, B12, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. They're known as psychobiotics for this reason. They're not just probiotics, they're psychobiotics. They're, they're helping the, the gut brain axis drive up BDNF to help our little hippocampus defend itself against the stresses of life. Uh, the uh, flavonoids, hesperidin, rutin, the herb St. John's wort, esin, epigenin. And St. John's wort's really fascinating. So when scientists removed rutin, the flavonoid rutin from St. John's wort, it no longer had an antidepressant action. It was the rutin in St. John's wort, which was the mimic for, the, for BDNF, which was driving the BDNF receptor that was helping fight depression. So look out for rutin in various, um, various phytonutrients in different plants and fruits and vegetables. Um, so once the track B receptor is activated, we then need something within a neuron to pass that message on from the track B receptor to DNA. And this message is passed on by something called CREB. The C in CREB stands for CAMP. If, if anyone's interested, it's cyclic adenosine monophosphate. It's um, it's, a, it's called a second messenger, which means it passes the message on from a receptor like track B to our DNA and then tells neurons to make things which can help protect the integrity of those neurons and help protect against depression. So I'm looking at the 
at the neurotrophin and its receptor, how we can trigger the receptor to support mental health and protect against neurodegeneration, and then how that receptor then passes its message on to DNA, and that's via CREB. And interestingly, caffeine is supportive of CREB gene expression. So CREB, um, it's a CAMP uh, regulatory element, element binding protein for people that like acronyms. And, and it does all these wonderful things. It's, it helps the gene expression for many um, different processes which protect uh, our brain health, and protect us against depression and inflammation and neurodegeneration and depression. So I've, I've uh, explained everything in this diagram, the, the last few steps. So I've talked about BDNF, how it binds into a track B receptor, how that receptor then passes a message onto CREB and how CREB switches on DNA to make brain supportive gene expression. And looking again, the things that can support BDNF, phytonutrients, green spaces, social enrichment, yoga, meditation, deep breathing, low inflammation, exercise, we'll come onto those in the later part of the presentation. The trap B receptor, we can support that with flavonoids, probiotics, the, the psychobiotics that I talked about, the Mediterranean diet, omega-3 fatty acids, berries B12, CREB, exercise and coffee um, can also support that too. So coffee's um, had a bad press with lots of people, but coffee, uh, caffeine in particular, can help support the blood-brain barrier. It can make the integrity of the blood-brain barrier more effective too. Caffeine can reduce inflammation in the brain as well. So in the right amounts, as long as you're not dr drinking lots of caffeine that really stresses us out, in the right amounts, caffeine can help with brain integrity, can help with more mitochondria, can reduce inflammation, and it can tighten the blood brain barrier that makes the integrity of the whole brain more efficient. So I never used to drink coffee until 10 years ago, but when I started reading the research on how beneficial it was, I thought I've got to be drinking this because <laughs> I can, the research is really pointing towards something protecting my brain uh, into later years. And in fact, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, people that drink coffee have a far lower risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and depression if they drink coffee. I haven't talked about nerve growth factor that much, but um, here we talk about lion's mane mushroom and um, nerve growth factor working through the track A receptor. So compounds within lion's mane mushroom can activate track A. So in animal studies, polysaccharides and diterpenes from lion's mane mushroom were able to stimulate neuron growth and repair. And in fact, a reduction of depression and anxiety has been reported after four weeks of lion's, mushroom, lion's mane mushroom intake. So working, uh, stimulating that, uh, that track A receptor and acting as a mimic for nerve growth factor. The omega-3 fatty acid EPA can increase nerve growth factor by lowering inflammation. Uh, and I find this really fascinating. I find it quite uh, moving in, in, in a way that these Italian researchers have found out that romantic love can increase the amount of nerve growth factor. So when, when you feel really sensitive, when, when someone falls in love and your whole nerves are, are just firing and with happiness and it's because nerve growth factor. So these Italian researchers from the country that's steeped in romance have found that nerve growth factor is just increasing rapidly and helping your nervous system feel the effects of that love. So no wonder some people are addicted to falling in love because of that it must be such a big high. So nerve growth factor supports the survival and maintenance of sensory neurons. However, it can be excessively, nerve growth factor can heighten the sense of pain as well, which is the downside of it if someone's got an inflammatory condition and they're found in osteo osteoarthritis and lower back pain, that nerve growth factor may heighten the experience of pain as well. But generally it's a good thing. Inducers are both BDNF and nerve growth factor are ginger, green tea, berberin, magnolia bark, extra virgin olive oil, and resveratrol. And I really like the Mediterranean diet because it's rich in extra virgin olive oil and lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, 
and but the star is extra virgin olive oil uh, because if it's it has plenty of um, plenty of um, it's allurpin, I think, is one of the is one of the main things which can help drive up brain derived neurotrophic factor. But also the the Mediterranean diet is um, the, the definition of the Mediterranean diet also includes the social connection, the social en enrichment of being around your friends and family and eating and preparing food together. So not only does extra virgin olive oil and the fruits and vegetables that are in the Mediterranean diet help at a biochemical level the the connection to the people that you care about, cooking together. And also the, another part of the definition of the Mediterranean diet is buying glasses and, and plates from local um, shops to support the local community. So it's, it's a really immersive diet. It's not just the things in the diet. It's connecting to people and the environment and your community as well, which is, is the is the proper definition of the Mediterranean diet if you look at the United Nations definition. So I, I love that. I'm sorry, I've just gone off on a tangent there, but I love that connection. Um, microglia. These are the resident immune cells of the brain. Um, and looking at the, the brain, if we can modify these immune cells in the brain to stop them inflaming so much, we can help protect against depression and neurodegeneration. Um, and if these microglia are inflamed, um, they can reduce levels of BDNF, which then can increase the risk of depression and inhibit these little uh, hippocampal stem cells moving on to adult hippocampal neurons. So the brain has its own immune system and microglia, they're kind of macrophages that are the resident immune cells of the brain. Um, so 15% of all brain cells are microglia and they act as the first line of defense in the brain, dealing with infection and clearance of damaged neurons. So they're really important. When they're activated in an inflammatory way, they're really important to deal with this frontline uh, damage. They're like the, the soldiers at the front of the, of the lines. But we need the cavalry to come along afterwards to clear up the damage that's been done and help with the healing. And uh, a lot of the time when the brain's inflamed, the cavalry never turn up to deal with a mess, mess afterwards. And we really need to find out what diet and nutrition and lifestyle can bring that cavalry in to help heal the brain and not allow the inflammation to carry on for too long. So when kept in check, Microglia provide essential brain maintenance, but when out of control, they're catastrophic for brain health and integrity. And when activated, they, they suppress BDNF, BDNF. We need them activated for a short space of time, but then they need to switch off. And for many people suffering from depression, from neurodegeneration, MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, it doesn't switch off and therefore the brain starts to degenerate. So when they're activated, uh, they're in this state called M1. They're pro-inflammatory M1 microglia. And they have these inflammatory mediators called cytokines produced excessively. And these damaged stem cells, they inhibit neurogenesis. You can see in the diagram when they're inflamed, they inhibit neurogenesis and the poor hippocampus cannot repair itself. It shrinks, and increases the chances of depression. Um, so these M1 microglia, they inhibit neurogenesis. The poor hippocampus cannot defend itself against chronic inflammation. So how, what can we do to help transform these microglia into a more anti-inflammatory type or phenotype? Well, fruits and vegetables and a, a good diet and lifestyle. And we'll, we'll look at the, the fruits and vegetables first, but also the typical Western diet. So if you look at the diagram, um, M1 classic, the pro-inflammatory phase, if you look at the diagram, there's something called NF-kappa B. That's an inflammatory transcription factor. If you look at the shift to the anti-inflammatory phase, this requires NRF2. It's an anti-inflammatory transcription factor. They both talk to DNA, these transcription factors. And the typical Western diet, plenty of, uh, plenty of burgers and fried food and fast food, it will triple the levels of NF-kappa B. NRF2 is raised and will suppress NF-kappa B 
um, NRF2, lots of fruits and vegetables in the Mediterranean diet and a good lifestyle raise NRF2 and it will decrease brain inflammation and increase our chances of having um, a, a healthy hippocampus and defend us against dep depression. So the Western diet will increase the chances of dep uh, depression by raising inflammation and a good diet such as the Mediterranean diet, a healthy diet will decrease, dramatically decrease the chances of depression. So switching these microglia um, from M1 to M2 using um, various fruits and vegetables is a, a possible treatment for depression and Alzheimer's disease because that switch increases BDNF and helps the brain integrity. So this uh, paper looks at how natural products, and I, we've talked about it before, how these natural products can work with these receptors in the brain and trigger the production of brain supportive proteins and switch off inflammation. And in this uh, paper, they show that um, the uh, switch can help with um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, ALS and multiple sclerosis. It's a, originally a French paper, so some of the spelling is quite odd because of the, it's a French paper and they, um, they can't spell like the, the UK people can't spell either. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the reason why it's got strange spellings. Um, so NRF2, this anti-inflammatory transcription factor, NRF2, it's activated by uh, lots of compounds, plant compounds in uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, particularly green tea, uh, turmeric, curcumin in, in turmeric. So all these compounds, these flavonoids, these phytonutrients are great at activating NRF2 um, to help reduce inflammation. And they're not just antioxidants. This is the fascinating thing. Um, actually, we've evolved a lot of these flavonoids and these polyphenols in plants are actually pro-oxidants. And we've evolved to take these pro-oxidants and, and in reaction to these pro-oxidants in these fruits and vegetables over uh, thousands of years, we've learned how to deal with the, the mild toxicity of these um, polyphenols and then switch on our own internal antioxidant system. So yes, these fruits and vegetables can be mild antioxidants, but the biggest effect is through switching on our own antioxidant genes like superoxide dismutase, glutathione, uh, catalase. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating that these were mildly toxic because these fruits and vegetables want to defend themselves against invaders. Um, but these polyphenols that uh, protect them uh, actually, we've evolved to not only detoxify them, but to use them to, to, to protect all our cells and protect our brain health too. It's absolutely fascinating that we've taken the toxicity of the mild toxicity of these polyphenols and we use them to protect our whole body and protect our brain health. Someone can ask me that question again afterwards. If it's, it's, if it's not that clear, um, that the whole process is called hormesis. It's about a mild toxic product having a, a massive beneficial effect overall. It's called hormesis and, and exercise is the same thing. Exercise, exercise is mildly toxic, um, but the body responds to it by making lots of antioxidants, makes more mitochondria. So the mild toxicity of exercise actually has a profound benefit to the whole body. And that helps with mental health as well. If it's a new concept to you, just look up hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S. -E and that's a wonderful concept. And NRF2 is, is a transcription factor which works with this hormesis, the mild toxicity of our lives. Even the thinking is mildly toxic. Even thinking is mildly toxic. It makes a neurotransmitter called glutamate. And glutamate is mildly toxic, but the brain responds by detoxifying glutamate, its toxicity, and then making more antioxidants so the brain becomes stronger. So whatever you do, thinking, exercise, eating a healthy diet, it's mildly toxic, but it makes you stronger and protects you from depression. So effectively, food talks to our DNA. Um, the, all these compounds send little messages to our DNA and talk to our DNA. 
And I, I say here that junk food, it shouts at our DNA. It this NF kappa B that raises inflammation, that lowers BDNF, it's shouting, it's telling it to inflame. So no wonder people get depressed when they eat a junk food diet. However, fruit and vegetables, they whisper at our DNA. They actually tell things to calm down, to quieten down and protect the brain. So um, the, the typical Western diet, it can, it can, by eating lots of burgers and fries and sugary foods, rich in sugars and these, uh, this high fructose corn syrup, it's catastrophic for the brain because it raises inflammation. It destroys our, our neurons, particularly in the hippocampus, reduces the neurotrophins and is problematic. But fruits and vegetables, these fruits and vegetables have the opposite effect. They, they reduce inflammation, they raise BDNF and nerve growth factor, and they protect our brain. And interestingly, young adults, when they consumed a diet that was, uh, they cut out junk food and they increased lots of fruits and vegetables and healthy food, their, de their depression symptoms reduced in three weeks of eating um, a healthy diet. So when they consume fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lots of plenty of good food and avoided the typical junk food diet, then they started to get improvements in their depression symptoms. So I talked about microglia, um, looking at the cells, the inflammatory cells within the brain. Now I want to talk at more of a systemic level, how inflammation um, and the nervous system uh, interact. And it's, it could be considered the neuroimmune access. <clears throat> so this is how inflammation and the nervous system interact at a more global level within the body. It still has an effect on microglia and I'll show you what I mean. So inflammation, including brain microglia, can be controlled by the nervous system. So our nervous system can have a moderating effect on the immune system, including in the brain. And in fact, the brain can have uh, a control of the whole body's uh, immune system effect. And it could be either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, depending on where our nervous system is. If we're highly stressed, that can lead to a pro-inflammatory state in our brain and our body. And if we're relaxed, we can make it anti-inflammatory. So that the brain is really trying its hardest to keep inflammation down in the body. And uh, there's a lovely doctor, American doctor called Dr. Kevin Tracy, um, who is behind this understanding of how the nervous system controls inflammation. And Dr. Kevin Tracy, uh, if you want to look at him, he's got a, a lovely TED talk. Um, his, his mother died of a brain tumor, I believe. So he started becoming interested in, in how the nervous system functions because of the grief of his mother's death. And then he wanted to know even more. He was dealing with a, 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 a young infant that died of burns after being scalded by water. The baby died in his arms of sepsis, but it had no infection, no bacterial infection. And he couldn't understand. He was grief struck by this baby dying in his arms. And he wanted to know why did this baby die from sepsis when it had no bacterial infection. Most people think of sepsis as being an infectious inflammatory condition. Well, it didn't have any bacteria. It died just purely through the nervous system driving inflammation too hard and that led to the baby's death. So uh, Kevin Tracy uh, uh, understood this, this link or started to understand this link. And this section is, is basically based on Kevin Tracy's work. So I really highly recommend watching his TED talk. So the Autonomic nervous system or autonomic nervous system or ANS is a brain body interface that helps regulate our outer and inner worlds. I love that. I love that. The uh, autonomic nervous system, which consists of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. It's there to help us regulate our outer and inner worlds. We have to be able to respond to relaxation or stresses in our outer worlds. And the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, it operates through the vagus nerve. It's not Las Vegas, it's, it's, it's a vagus nerve. It's completely different derivative. And it uses the neurotransmitter acetylcholine um, to drive 
the vagus nerve. And the autonomic nervous system and the vagus nerve, they help to dampen the inflammatory response. And we're understanding this more and more, that the nervous system can dampen inflammation. Um, we're, we're really starting to understand that. It's fascinating. So the modulation of the vagus nerve can be useful for many chronic inflammatory diseases, including depression, including multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. In fact, any inflammatory condition you can think of, if you can modulate the vagus nerve for controlling our stress responses, we can reduce inflammation. So the autonomic nervous system, if we have a good diet, lifestyle, gut health, low stress, inflammation, all the things we talked about before, these can increase parasympathetic tone and increase BDNF. If we have a poor diet, lifestyle, gut health, high stress and inflammation, that can increase sympathetic tone and lower BDNF, increase our chances of depression. So as I said, the, the vagus nerve, it comes from, uh, it's, it's derived from wanderer. It's, it means like vagabond is a wanderer. And so the vagus nerve, it, because it, it is ubiquitous throughout the whole body, so it wanders throughout the body, it picks up um, what's going on in our outer world and translates that to our nervous system. So this vagabond of the vagus nerve wanders throughout our whole body. So the inflammatory reflex that was discovered by Dr. Kevin Tracy, he's such a humble man and, and um, yeah, it's just, I'd love listening to him. So the, uh, the inflammatory reflex, I mean, it's kind of a misnomer really, that it, it helps reduce inflammation in the whole body. So it works, we look on the right-hand side of the diagram, there's the afferent vagus nerve, which feeds the brain. So the body's picking up information, sensory information through the afferent vagus nerve. And if there's infection or injury or various stresses, the, the brain picks it up through the afferent vagus nerve. And then the brain tries to quell that. It tries to calm it down. It will be, it'll be sensing what's going on in the body. It will then send out commands through the efferent vagus nerve through the celiac ganglia and through the splenic nerve and it will then uh, connect with T cells that produce the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and this acetylcholine will then dock with macrophages and these macrophages will, will be calmed down by uh, acetylcholine and this will re reduce the levels of inflammation throughout the body, body. So it's a really nice way of the brain keeping its keeping across everything that's going on in the body, it's monitoring everything in the body. But if the body gets really, really stressed, the brain will become fatigued. It won't be able to keep inflammation down in the body. The brain will start to inflame as well. So we've got inflammation in our body, got inflammation in our gut, and the brain will say after a period of time, I can't deal with this, I can't deal with this. And the brain will inflame and it will also increase the risk of depression too. Also, the, our thoughts, feelings, diet, and lifestyle, and gut health can also affect the vagus nerve and interfere or help support reduce inflammation in the whole body. So I love this quote, the brain modulates the limits and the magnitude of the immune response. So health conditions and the inflammatory reflex. So um, balanced um, a balanced inflammatory reflex will help increase BDNF. An unbalanced inflammatory reflex, if you've got inflammation going in our body, if we're eating the wrong foods, if our gut is struggling, we've got dysbiosis, if we've got injuries that aren't healing, then that will have an effect on the brain as well and decrease BDNF. So treatments that can help increase parasympathetic tone, which then helps with the vagus nerve, which then helps lower uh, inflammation, can also raise BDNF and um, also be useful in uh, helping treat depression. Obesity is something that increases depression and we're just starting to understand why. And uh, one of the big reasons is that free fatty acids that uh, are exported from the liver during um, in, in obese individuals because they've got excessive fat being synthesized in their liver and exported as very low density lipoproteins and producing lots of triglycerides and free fatty acids. This has the effect of shifting the autonomic nervous system towards more sympathetic tone and away from parasympathetic tone, decreasing vagal activity 
and lowering BDNF. And this increases the risk of cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's and depression. So it's, it's fascinating that someone that's got a higher body mass index um, and is obese is going to suffer from depression far more easily than someone is a, of a, a good body mass index. Vagal nerve stimulation can be supported for multiple sclerosis patients. So I've got the vagal nerve can be supported by good social connections, exercise, and a good enriching environment. I'll come on to this in a bit. Uh, and this helps support through the vagal nerve, these acetylcholine receptors, which reduce inflammation, raise brain-derived neurotrophic factor, decrease these uh, inflammatory T cells, microglia um, as well. Vagus nerve stimulation can support uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And if you, if you look carefully at the diagram, you can see the vagus nerve going through the celiac ganglion, going through the splenic nerve, then communicates with T cells, which, re which release acetylcholine going to these, um, they're called alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. That's, that's what that all stands for. And those receptors are receptive to acetylcholine that's triggered by uh, a positive response from the vagal nerve. And these, these decrease inflammation in macrophages and microglia and also support mitochondria. They also support mitochondria too. Um, so research suggests that the vagal nerve help, may help reduce inflammation in patients suffering from Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Other conditions supported by this vagal connection by pushing the parasympathetic nervous system, um, helping this neuroimmune axis. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis, sepsis and Parkinson's disease can all be supported by this vagal nerve stimulation. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. Um, it's vital for it's vital for cognition and for control of inflammation. So our understanding of it is is far deeper than it has been. Uh, I mean, we used to just think about it as a neurotransmitter just for cognition. And just like serotonin, there's now a greater understanding that serotonin does far more than just make us feel good. That serotonin has these. Uh, brain integrity enhancing effects, acetylcholine, as well as cognition helping us think more clearly, acetylcholine has this anti-inflammatory effect as well. And we're starting to understand that because the people that made drugs for Alzheimer's disease made this drug which raised the levels of acetylcholine in the brain, thinking it would help with cognition. Little did they know that it also reduced inflammation in the brain as well. Um, and this is because the drug denepazil, which is used in Alzheimer's, can inhibit the enzyme which breaks down acetylcholine. Um, but acetylcholine, as we've just seen, can also reduce inflammation. So it's, it's great, isn't it, that, that we're understanding far more of, about the complexity of the brain, how the brain, the neurotransmitters in the brain have a far more, uh, a far broader effect than just passing signals, they have other jobs too. They have other reasons to exist too. And they can be anti-inflammatory. They can help with uh, various structures in the brain. They can help raise BDNF. It, it's wonderful that these neurotransmitters are so beneficial. So acetylcholine can help with uh, increases in BDNF as well. So to make acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter that helps with our cognition, that helps raise BDNF, we need to have the right nutrients to support it too. So we need choline to make acetylcholine. And this increases parasympathetic tone and raises BDNF. So um, meat, eggs, phosphatidylcholine, lecithin, soya beans, these are all sources of choline that can help, help us make acetylcholine. Um, and so people that are vegan would have to be really careful because the vegans are really low in choline unless they're unless they're really careful and making sure they're eating something that has choline in it vegans are not going to get not only just b12 but they're not going to get enough um enough choline as well so yeah they should i know many vegans and they're not not particularly careful about the deficiencies in the diet and they they kind of have to be really aware that B12 and choline could be deficient to make sure there's adequate sources. Interestingly, people with depression, um, you've got the two extremes. We've got people that are vegan that have higher risk of depression, and we have people that 
um, a, a devout meat eaters that don't like vegetables, they're also at high risk of depression too, because they're not getting these wonderful fruits and vegetables, um, and they're perhaps eating excessive inflammatory saturated fats as well. So acetylcholine, as we've seen, it's anti-inflammatory, it also helps with cognition. So if we slow the breakdown of acetylcholine down, it gets broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Um, if we slow its, its degradation through things like green and white tea, coffee, quercetin, resveratrol, curcumin, rosemary, chlorogenic acid from artichoke and coffee and cardamom that's uh, quite often used as a spice in, in curries and, and Asian foods. All these things can slow down the degradation of acetylcholine, which can then be used to reduce inflammation in the body and the brain, improve cognition. Um, and so all these things are really important. Uh, this is a, a diagram showing the flow of the, the thinking I've put together. So increased parasympathetic tone and vagal tone, working with the, the, the vagal nerves um, can increase the need for the anti-inflammatory effects of acetylcholine. The enzyme that makes it from acetyl-CoA and choline is choline acetyltransferase. And vitamin A, ferulic acid from brown rice, it's quite rich in brown rice, um, DHA, the omega-3 fatty acid, and acetylcarnitine can all help synthesize acetylcholine as well as choline itself. Um, and the things that slow its breakdown down to help with this anti-inflammatory effect are green and white tea, coffee, kirsten, resveratrol, curcumin, rosemary, chlorogenic acid from uh, coffee um, and artichoke, cardamom, and black seed oil. I only found this out last week. Black seed oil, it's really, really good. It's made from cumin seed. Um, it's black seed oil, and this also helps to slow down the degradation of acetylcholine. I've seen a few um, people looking at black seed oil in, in um, having its anti-inflammatory effect in the brain and supporting people with Parkinson's and brain inflammation. Also, uh, acetylcholine esterase, this can be accelerated when someone has a high body mass index. So there's a, you can see that um, the parasympathetic nervous system is not as active when someone is obese or has a high body mass index. And also, their acetylcholine has been degraded more rapidly when they've got a high body mass index too. Acetylcholine is not always good. Um, we have to have it in the right amount. Um, snake venom increases acetylcholine and stops us breaking down acetylcholine. So acetylcholine excessively is really bad for us. It's, um, and snake venom has something that inhibits acetylcholinesterase. So we need to have acetylcholine. We don't want it to break down too quickly to protect us, but it must break down eventually, otherwise it can become toxic in itself. So that's, that's um, there's, there's some herbs which may push people over the edge by not allowing it to break down. So I prefer to take these natural products here, like the green and white tea, the coffee, Kirsten, these things I feel really safe with but you can, have to, you can always have too much of a good thing. Uh, the gut-brain axis. Um, the vagus nerve uh, is a modulator of this uh, gut-brain axis, which you may have heard of. So the brain and the gut, the brain's in communication with the whole body. The whole body is communication with the brain all the time. They, they're not separate. They're, they're working together. Uh, they're working to, together as a cohesive unit. So the, the gut sends signals from the gut via the vagus nerve to the brain. And then the brain sends signals uh, via the vagus nerve to the gut. Um, about 80 to 90% of the vagus nerve connection, the fibers are from the gut to the brain and about 10 to 20% are from the brain to the gut. And this, this um, helps influence, this gut brain axis helps influence um, uh, things like uh, depression, if it's not connected properly, you get depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, MS, they can all have links with the poor gut-brain um, connection, poor gut-brain access. And inflammatory gut disorders, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can also be affected by a poor connection or um, stresses that are occurring in the nervous system translating into the gut. 
As I said earlier, uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus and Bifidobacterium longum, these uh, are known as psychobiotics. They help with the gut-brain axis. They've been shown to have mood-enhancing effects. And the gut-brain axis is, in, is in, it's imperative that there's a good connection via the vagus nerve to help the brain make sufficient BDNF to help our hippocampus to be uh, working and to make these help these stem cells become adult hippocampal neurons to protect our brain health, to protect our memory and our mood uh, um, throughout our lives. And laboratory animals um, that had the vagus nerve connection severed, they had reduced BDNF activity. Um, and so the laboratory animals struggled to keep the hippocampus uh, maintained because of this loss of connection. It sounds quite cruel, really. It's quite cruel to do this. We, we we're really horrible to animals, but um, they found this connection is so important for people's mental health. Uh, animal In animals, they showed that the animal was not able to maintain all the structures necessary for mental health when this vagus nerve connection was severed. And also that would apply to gut dysbiosis as well. So such animals struggle to grow new neurons in the hippocampus, meaning that the neurogenesis is compromised when the gut brain axis is compromised. You can't emphasize enough how important the gut is in protecting against depression and also dementia, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in later life. I don't know whether you've heard, but uh, people that suffer from Parkinson's, there's many, many people have a disrupted gut brain axis and many people with Parkinson's have suffered from gut dysbiosis or constipation for 10 years before they're diagnosed with Parkinson's. So one of the theories is that the damaged proteins that are in the brain that cause Parkinson's may actually start in the gut and travel up through the vagus nerve or through the nervous system over 10 years and then get into the brain. Um, interestingly, people with Parkinson's might lose their sense of smell. And I have this with many people I work with. They lose their sense of smell five years before they develop Parkinson's. So it could be that these um, inflammatory proteins are infiltrating the um, olfactory nerves before they get to the nerves that produce dopamine. So if anyone loses their sense of smell, if they've got gut dysbiosis, if they've got um, constipation. I'm not saying it will cause Parkinson's, but don't just say, oh, that's just, that's just me. I don't smell things that well. Oh, that's just me. I've got constipation. No, that's a warning sign that something, if that's happening, it means that your nervous system's not working as well as it could do. So do something now. Do something now. So psychological stress. I looked at the stresses with the autonomic nervous system and how that impacts the immune system, I wanted to look at psychological stress and its effect on brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So Hans Selye, the, the grandfather of the stress response, is everyone that studied nutrition has probably had, um, you probably um, had someone telling you about him. Uh, so everybody knows what stress is, but nobody knows what stress is. We all bandy around this term <laughs> stress but what, what actually is it? What actually is it? So stress, it's just like overtaking in a car. So if you, if you overtake, um, it's overtake, get the job done and then relax. Um, we shouldn't, we should not uh, just stay in the outside lane. We should not just stay in the fast lane. Once we overtake, once, once we've had that stress response, which is really beneficial, we should not stay in the fast lane. We should then move back in again and then calm down. So acute stress or low cortisol, it's beneficial. It's, it's beneficial. As I said before, we need to have novelty. We need to have things that motivate us. We need to have things that inspire us. So stress in a small amount is really good. So stress in a small amount it can enhance our mitochondria, it can improve our energy production, it can help our brain um, evolve and adapt to situations and actually help us when we do get extreme stressful situations. It can be protective in small amounts and it allows us to adapt to challenges and it raises brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Chronic stress, on the other hand, this being in the, the fast lane, 
eventually, if you see in the middle diagram, this is a mitochondrion in the brain that's being exposed to extreme stresses, chronic stresses. And it, it says, rather than being happy, it's now saying, oh, now this is getting too much. Uh, and if this continues, it leads to neurodegeneration, it leads to the shrinkage of the hippocampus, and you get these pathological adaptations to chronic stress and reduced BDNF. I've seen this lovely term that describes stress as a call for resources, a call for energy, a call for, for nutrition, a call for nourishment. And it's, it's over and above what the body can normally give and the brain can normally give. So don't think you can maintain it at that level all the time. It's asking, it's, borrow, it's like going to the bank and asking for a huge loan. You can use, you can spend that loan, but you then have to pay it back for, for the next few months or years. And that's the same with stress. You're, it's, a, it's a loan, loan of resources, and it cannot be maintained for a long period of time. And if you try doing that, the, the brain becomes bankrupted, the body becomes bankrupted, it can't do it. I hope that analogy is, is helpful. So stress can be beneficial if it leads to a strong sense of achievement. If stress is associated with exercise, a strong sense of achievement, social enrichment, then feel good neuromodulators such as dopamine, endogenous opioids or BDNF, they're released. So stress in small amounts are really good and make us feel good. And that can become addictive and lead us into this idea that we can carry on doing it, but we can't. Um, but these feel good neuromodulators can block the damaging effects of things like cortisol, the stress hormone and help protect against depression, but only in a short period of time. When stress is excessive, the detrimental inflammatory microglia, they're activated and can lead to an increased risk of depression. So stress has this optimal balance. We, if we have a small amount of stress, it's really good for us. It keeps us focused, it keeps us energized, it keeps us passionate, it keeps us motivated. Um, but if we have too much stress, this is distress, this can lead to burnout. And we just don't have enough resources to keep the brain operating because we're just using too many resources. On the other hand, if someone is too relaxed, too calm, this can lead to boredom, lack of inspiration. And these people can be just as exhausted as someone that's overstimulated. It's, it's the both, both, um, both, both work in, in e you've got to be in the middle. We need the hum humans have evolved for novelty. Um, hunter gatherers, it's considered that hunter gatherers um, not only did, did exercise of hunter gatherers help increase the brain size, but novelty, when we're hunter gatherers, we're finding completely different environments all the time. And we thrive on this novelty. And this novelty combined with exercise has helped drive up our brain size. And it's, um, it's really important to have that novelty. Also, social connection as well. Social, social connections, the more people we connect with, it, it helps stimulate brain performance and neural connection as well. And so these lockdowns have been catastrophic for many people because the brain needs social connection to help stimulate it. And by locking people down, the brain is really struggling. Um, childhood bullying. Um, I had a, a few difficult episodes in my early life, so I'm, I'm quite interested in, in this effect on someone. And how I got into studying nutrition myself was because of uh, fatigue issues and I wanted to understand the fatigue and inflammation and how it affect me personally and yeah I, I struggled with people I was quite quiet and it, it allowed people to to pick on me and and I, I can really uh, empathize with what goes on with some young people now that that are, are treated badly and unfairly so bullying can have an effect on inflammation through this inflammatory effect on the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, translating to um, the brain and the whole body's immune system. Uh, this can also have an effect on gene expression, inflammatory gene expression into adulthood. So if this child, if children are treated badly in their formative years, this inflammation can change their epigenetics and change the gene expression so they can be more at risk of depression and inflammatory disease in their adult life. So we really have to be um, consciously careful of treating a, a younger generation uh, 
carefully and lovingly and support them as much as we can. In fact, any adult, just don't treat any adult unfairly. Take all your frustration out on another avenue, but, but treat people kindly. So yeah, this ele elevated low-grade inflammation can translate um, to adulthood in, in, in many people in, in their later years. Um, and in fact, multiple sclerosis, if you, like, if you look at Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, those, those are kind of aging uh, degenerative diseases. With multiple sclerosis, this is a, a disease that often starts in young people. These young people frequently have had some degree of um, either abuse or trauma in their formative years, which has had a negative effect on their nervous system, which comes out in the early adulthood. So multiple sclerosis is a young person's disease that's experienced something, whether it's lack of vitamin D or whether it's trauma in their formative years. So I, if, I work in, if I'm working with someone with MS, uh, it's a completely different pattern to working with someone with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, lifestyle, the vagus nerve and brain derived neurotrophic factor. And I've mentioned the, the connection to um, environmental enrichment, social enrichment, and just diet and lifestyle by having good people around you, good environments around you and how that impacts on the brain. I want to go into that a bit more now because I find, I don't know, I, I just, when I go out for a walk now and I think, wow, I feel great and I can feel it having a positive effect on my whole being, on my nervous system, on my mood. And I, I'm just far more, I'm far more respectful of, of, of the nature of the countryside and, and, and people around me as well. So the parasympathetic nervous system acting via the vagus nerve, which we've talked about before, can help increase BDNF. And we've talked about the things that can support the parasympathetic nervous system, reducing stress, um, supporting the vagus nerve and uh, BDNF levels. We've been looking at diet mainly and reducing inflammation through reducing stress. Now we want to look at some other environmental factors. And how can we measure this uh, change, this positive change in the vagus nerve that supports our brain function? Well, first of all, we can look at biofeedback um, there's something called the HeartMath app for iPhone and Android, and it's available from a company called Inner Balance. It's available on Amazon, and you can use it to measure how variable the heart rate is. It's a biofeedback tool. And um, the more variable the heart rate is, the more vagus nerve activation a person has, the more anti-inflammatory effects will be going on within that person. Uh, if the heart rate is less variable, then that shows that they're more stressed and they're more sympathetically activated and more likely to have inflammation. I think there's also something called the aura ring as well, which uh, a person can wear and it gives feedback about their nervous system through heart rate variability. And it sounds strange, doesn't it, that the heart rate is variable and that, that, is, that is good for us. Um, and uh, this heart rate variability is decreased. It's so it's less variable in depression, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, and cognitive decline. So the vagus nerve can be stimulated by increasing parasympathetic tone and increasing brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, we can stimulate the vagus nerve. And it's, it's interesting, some of these activities that I've talked about a bit before. So breathing, deep breathing. There's something called the herring brow reflex. This deep breathing uh, and it's fascinating that when we deep breathe, our lungs inflate fully. We abdominal breathe, we inflate our lungs fully. And there's stretch receptors in our lungs that stop us damaging our lungs by breathing too much, by inhaling too much. And it's, it's, it's the vagus nerve uh, is connected to these muscles that tells them to stop and relax. So it's a cheat. We inhale as much as we can. And the herring brow reflex says, don't damage this person's lungs. Let's switch on the vagus nerve. Let's relax this person, calm them down, reduce inflammation. So deep breathing, not only is it good to deep breathe, but we have this cheat where we can trigger relaxation. We can trigger anti-inflammatory effects just by inflating our lungs, abdominal breathing, and inflating our lungs. 
There's also um, ear massage as well. Uh, there's vagal nerve receptors in our ears and some people are probably really sensitive on, on their earlobes and uh, there's vagal nerve receptors on our, on our ears and some people massage their ears when they're stressed and this can calm people down by working with the stimulating the vagus nerve. Outdoor uh, green spaces and blue spaces in the country. So green in green environments, blue by the sea, waterfalls, lakes, rivers, waterfalls. All these have a stimulatory effect on the parasympathetic nervous system, which trigger relaxation in our body and make us feel good. We feel good. Um, in these uh, outdoor spaces with, with designed, it's called a green prescription by some, some researchers. You need your green prescription. So locking people indoors was just the worst thing to do to um, the, a person's immune system. You're not gonna be able to fight infections that well when you're locked indoors away from people. Um, no social connection, locked indoors, not exercising. That's the worst thing you can do for someone's immune system to help fight a virus. But Sorry, I'm, that's, that's me, I'm biased. Um, social enrichment, so we need to have human connection. And if we can't have human connection, then having a, a, a loving pet or dog or cat or whatever, that can be uh, something which can trigger this stimulation as well. Um, and when it's people, it's, it's connecting via oxytocin. You may have heard of the, the love hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin will trigger the connection between pets and people and friends and family and mothers. So when we connect with someone, we connect with a, um, whether it's a dog or family or mother or father, when we connect with them and we feel that really deep connection, oxytocin is released and that triggers the vagus nerve to reduce inflammation in our body. All these things feel great, don't they? And the reason they feel great is because we're reducing inflammation in our body. We're driving things that support brain health. Our brain is just uh, firing with lots of great feelings because these things are designed to work that way. It would be really perverse if being with people you hated made you feel good. That wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense at all. So of course, you, of course you're gonna feel good. Of course your brain's gonna work better if you're around people that make you feel really good and you can connect with. So, yes, singing, singing your heart out, just singing to your heart's content, that will drive the vagus nerve. Listening to music, music, when you say that music lifts your soul and feeds your spirit, it does. It, it, the music will, in a, in a way with the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, it will push the vagus nerve, it will help drive protective brain health. Um, I'm not sure about death metal, maybe that, maybe that's the exception, but, but definitely music that lifts your spirits um, is something that will protect you. Laughter and crying, that laughing your heart out, crying, obviously not crying if you're crying um, and just can't stop crying because something is so stressful, but crying and the release, if, if someone's holding a lot of pent up frustration, then crying can release um, a lot of stresses and that can have a really beneficial effect on the nervous system and can help support brain health. And in fact, there's some people have found there's uh, stress hormones released in tears as well, that stress hormones can be flushed out through tears as well. Exercise, as I said, exercise is something which is mildly toxic in small amounts, but the body responds by making more mitochondria, it makes more antioxidants, and it makes more BDNF in response to exercise. So exercise in the right amount is absolutely important for brain health. Not excessive exercise, ex ex excessive exercise can be detrimental, but, but exercise is really important for brain health. As I said, hunter-gatherers, it's thought that hunter-gatherers, um, the exercise of hunter-gatherers may have been one of the reasons why our brain is so much bigger than the other primates. Cold exposure, this can also increase vagal nerve stimulation as well. But be careful if you do decide to swim in cold oceans and expose yourself to cold, make sure that you are working with people that are experienced in this matter because people can die of hypothermia if they're not used to it. So if you do use cold exposure, then, then make sure you're around someone that, that, that's experienced in this matter. And I, I have a friend 
who every single day uh, uh, goes into the sea in the south of England, which is freezing. <laughs> it's absolutely freezing. It's not like California. It's freezing. Um, and uh, she has rheumatoid arthritis and she finds that the exposure to the cold sea every single day has this anti-inflammatory effect and it makes her life bearable. The pains in her joints go away after she's been in the sea for about, I don't know, for about a minute, that has an effect. So it's working through the uh, parasympathetic nervous system, vagus nerve, and it's triggering these anti-inflammatory effects that I've talked about through the vagus nerve, through acetylcholine, and then driving down autoimmunity in her joints. So it's absolutely fascinating to see it in action. It's absolutely fascinating. Yoga and meditation, uh, these can all increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor and increase heart rate variability. And in this study I've got listed here, um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor was found to triple the levels uh, in, in, in levels after three months of yoga and meditation. So people that are completely chilled now, <laughs> they've had three months of yoga and meditation, they're completely chilled. Um, their parasympathetic nervous system, their vagus nerves is, is just, just in a divine space. Uh, they're loving everybody <laughs> after three months. Uh, and yeah, inflammation goes right down. No wonder they feel so chilled. Interestingly, acupuncture stimulates the vagus nerve to support brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And there's a correspondence with the proximity of acupoints to the vagus nerve. And in animal models, if they remove the nerves, again, being cruel to animals to understand ourselves, but we, we do this, um, the removal of the vagal and splenic nerves, which communicate to um, these T cells, these anti-inflammatory T cells, if you remove these vagal nerves, then there's, there's a, a loss of anti-inflammatory effect of acupuncture. So it seems like the uh, vagal nerve is important for the effects of acupuncture. And you may have seen these new devices which can stimulate the vagus nerve as well as, as um, their electrical devices which can stimulate the vagus nerve to help reduce inflammation. So people um, have a look at this. <laughs> so when, when people look at these two uh, pictures, I know I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bias you in a way, but if you look at the left-hand picture, uh, I definitely feel more relaxed looking at the trees and the grass and the sunsets. I definitely feel more relaxed. You look at the right-hand picture, it's more of an urban environment. It's got uh, rather stark imagery. Um, I definitely feel more relaxed looking at the left picture. So people, they, we need a green prescription. Again, in this picture here, if you look at the left-hand picture, do you feel more relaxed looking at the left-hand left -hand picture? Um, I feel definitely more stressed looking at the right. That's because this is a typical London day. As Susan knows, is that, Susan, is that a typical London day? Yes, it is. That's a typical London day. Um, and it's quite depressing. It's gray, it's overcast, it's wet and it's cold and it's miserable. I feel quite depressed looking at that. But look at the left-hand picture. It's got plenty of variety of plants. And, and, and interestingly, in the studies that have looked at the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nervous system, the more variety of plants, the more variety of animals, uh, the greater the effect of relaxation that we get, the greater improvements in brain integrity. We, we love to have variety. We love to have these wide variety of plants and animals. And also contours in the land as well. The more hills, um, more variety in the contours of the land, that has a beneficial effect as well. If you go out and you're walking on somewhere that's completely flat and desolate, and there's nothing in the horizon that's of interest to you, um, that's not as good as walking up a hill or a mountain with lots of trees and animals and like you see a deer or maybe in your country, maybe a bear or something like that. Mind you, you might want to run away from that and get stressed, but, um, but seeing all these different varieties is, is really, really beneficial. The emotional connection, which, which, which I mentioned via oxytocin, um, oxytocin can activate the vagus nerve. And we used to think this was um, just a, a mother-child connection 
but now we know this oxytocin is released in response to anyone we care about, anyone, friends, family, pets, if we care about that, that being, that person, um, if they care about us, then we'll release oxytocin and that will activate the vagus nerve and have anti-inflammatory effects throughout our body. So if you look at your dog and it starts wagging its tail, you know oxytocin has just been released. Can, is your dog wagging its tail, Susan? <laughs> so wag its tail, oxytocin, that's there. If a cat's purring or meowing, oxytocin. Um, so that's great. And I, I love all this because it, it brings to life. It's not just the nutrients. It's not just the nutrients. It's bringing to life how the world around us impacts a whole nervous system and helps heal us um, from outside in and obviously inside out if we're caring about other people. So loving friends and family can help protect our mental health. Oxytocin can activate the vagal nerve, can increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor, improve the brain integrity, support our hippocampus, and help regenerate our brains and protect us, not only against depression and mood disorders, but also against neurodegeneration in later life, against Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, um, and dementia as well. So finishing off, Susan kindly mentioned my books. I've got three. Uh, this talk kind of crosses between depression and mitochondria. So the depression book, it uh, talks mainly at a, a level of a lay person. So it's designed for someone with depression, an informed person that has depression. Whereas the mitochondria book is more aimed at nutritionists and people with a, with a deeper understanding of nutrition. And the Parkinson's disease book is aimed at a nutritionist or practitioner that's supporting someone with Parkinson's. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, sorry for the breakup earlier on. Um, are there are a few questions that, that people want to ask. I'll take my screen share off. Good. That way we get to see you when you answer questions. Yes. So I'll stop the share. There you go. We, so we, need, to, we need to see you in order to have a parasympathetic connection with you. Yes, to make the oxytocin. I'll, I'll <laughs> feel the love. <laughs> so is there, is there a few questions? I mean, how, how was it? Did, was the sound okay after the first breakups? It was, it was, yes. it was frustrating. It's good. Yeah. Turning off your video, you just remember that technique yeah. if you're having sound problems. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. So it wasn't the bandwidth of my system to take the take it all. So are there, are there a few questions? I'm I'm starting to scam through uh, scan through them to see, but I actually have a, had a couple of questions that came up during your presentation that were just mine. And um, um, thank you, Gilbert. One was about the um, the involvement of glycolysis versus um, mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation in not only in, in what you were talking about in terms of the maturation of the brain stem cells, but also in terms of how the development of the uh, of us as an organism when we go from a fetus that is living on glucose to um, fully differentiated uh, um, individual, our cells are differentiating. And on some level, that's the same process that we're seeing with stem cells. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I, I don't know if anyone's heard of endosymbiosis. Um, it's the whole evolutionary process where mitochondria through symbiosis combined with a alpha proteobacteria combined with archaea. And so archaea were um, working anaerobically to make their energy and alpha proteobacteria were aerobically and the, the, the synthesis of these two organisms made the building block of our cells and it's fascinating that when we go through this process of growth there's these two memories there's the anaerobic and aerobic memories of, of, of ourselves and so when there's rapid growth we tend to be more uh, anaerobic, but as you get to the maturation, we tend to be more aerobic. And I, and I love that, how it mirrors the evolution of our species, that there's, there's that evolutionary step billions of years ago, 
And we kind of do that as we evolve, we go through an evolution of ourselves as well. And I, I love that. I was also wondering about whether or not a recreation of that pattern in free living humans, our, our distant ancestors, where we would go from feasting to famine as a regular aspect of the hunter gatherer kind of existence, that that might have, you know, during feasting, we would be um, exposed to glucose and, and, mm. and during fasting, we'd be exposed to ketosis. And that yeah. may, that, that oscillation might drive the neurotrophic regeneration of the brain. I think yeah, de definitely if we um, go more into ketosis and uh, that that is more supportive of, of the brain, yes, definitely in mitochondria. Um, and I mean, we know that ketones can be supportive of, of uh, mitochondria, can heal mitochondria. Uh, there's, there's, there's beneficial effects of ketones on mitochondrial health. Gilbert? Unmute? On here. Okay, there now. You okay, <laughs> you're on. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but I'm only going to ask one because uh, of timing. You were talking about diet and everything you said about diet. I'm, you know, 100% uh, in line with that. But there was one thing about all the, the foods that you talked about. Uh, unless I missed it, I didn't hear anything about carbohydrates. Um, the 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 positive or negative side of it. I mean, I I I, I kind of I I put that in with the junk food diet, excessive carbohydrates, so excessive. Uh, fries and I, I mentioned about um, high fructose corn syrup. Um, did I mention that or not? I can't remember. But high fructose corn syrup and plenty of fries and sugar uh, are really problematic for the brain. The, there was a, a study called the Whitehall study looking at uh, simple carbohydrates. So two cans of cola uh, or the equivalent amount of cola, um, sugar, but, so having two cans of sugary drinks for a number of years, when they followed these people, I think it's the Whitehall study, they found a significant increase in the levels of depression in the people that had that amount of simple carbohydrate, that amount of sugar. Uh, and that, that, that was a really important okay. realization. Okay. I, I should have uh, uh, specified a little bit. I, I'm, I, I'm in line with all of that, but I was thinking more of uh, grains. Okay. Um, what do you think of uh, grains? I, I, my, I, I like um, the grains that are like, like oats that have um, soluble fibers in them. So I, li I like grains, that, yeah, so they have soluble fiber that can be fermented and to make short chain fatty acids. And those short chain fatty acids are really protective for the brain, uh, particularly, um, I think there's, yeah, butyrate is, is, the, is the most important one from fermented fibers, butyrate, that short chain fatty acid, not only can it help heal gut integrity, but it can also help with that gut brain axis as well. Um, a related question would be um, uh, the difference between let's say honey versus sugar. Um, I mean, honey, honey has some good things like propolis in it. So that, that's really, that's really good. And I believe honey is more fructose, isn't it? Than it is, um, glucose. Is, is that true? Does anyone know the difference in, in the, in the carbohydrate content? I don't. Um, but yeah, it's high in propolis. I, I still, I'm still wary of people using excessive honey. It's got some really good, um, properties, but I'm still wary of someone that's a bit of a sugar addict, and a lot of people in the West are a sugar addicts and replacing uh, a lot of their sweetness with, with honey. So I think honey in small amounts, great, but excessive amounts, a lot of people are hiding their sugar addiction behind honey saying this is really healthy. And I also noticed some of the drinks in health food shops will, um, will have these natural sweeteners, like uh, I have a natural sweetener, but when you look at it, it's high fructose. 
it's high fructose and fructose is a real problem, particularly for the liver. Uh, fructose can help decrease uh, energy levels in the body, particularly in the liver. And this, this is a real problem with particularly high fructose corn syrup. But honey is great, yes, but in, in small amounts, not, not excessive amounts. Karen. Hi, I just wanna thank you so much for this information. I work as a mental health counselor and I work very holistically. So I introduce you know, diet and exercise as um, ways to help people improve their mental emotional health. And mm -hmm. I think that your approach, the way that you come about this, talking about neurotropins um, will be easy for people to understand yeah. and make a connection and so motivate them to make those changes. Um, Cause it can be really hard for people. They're on that downward spiral, you know and so mm -hmm. cutting into it is difficult. So this will be helpful. Um, but I, I wanna ask, um, when do you think it's appropriate for people to use supplements as opposed to diet um, and exercise and other lifestyle changes? Um, you're right. I mean, I, the, the first thing I'll work with someone would, would be on their diet, diet and exercise. If, if they're just going to take supplements and think that those supplements can be a replacement for diet and exercise, it's a complete, completely waste of time. Um, but I tend to, uh, I work with other people with Parkinson's, so they're, yes, diet and exercise, but I'll, I will increase supplements, I will bring in supplements straight away because um, I've, I found from experience that they seem to benefit from, from supplements. Um, but other people might not, but it depends on what, it depends on the person. It really depends on the person. If they've got something which I feel is that diet alone is not going to be able to help them, then I will work with supplements too. Uh, but as you say, I, I would work with the diet first. If they're not prepared to make any changes in their diet, then it's a way I'm wasting my time, completely wasting my time. Also, if I've got, a, I've had this several times, if there's a, a husband, that won't do it, that the wife is doing all the running, I found that the husband never does anything. If the wife is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of my husband, can it, what can he do? They will never change because they, they have to come and they have to consult with me and I have to look in their eyes because <laughs> they're never going to do anything unless, unless you can really connect with them. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, exercise isn't something you can do by proxy. I know it's not, but uh, that connection with someone, if you're with a, if you're with a patient and you talk about exercise and their eyes glaze over, you know, you know, it's, you know that's, that's out. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's the word. And if you tell somebody, you know, when you're, when you're cooking in the kitchen and making dinner, dance around the kitchen. Yes. Think of that as exercise. Yeah, that's, that's really good, yeah. And music, you mentioned music as well. Yeah, yeah. So if you're dancing when you're singing or if you're dancing when you're listening to music, it's not exercise. <laughs> yeah, when I, in, in the winter, I, t I draw the curtains, I close the curtains and dance in the winter to exercise so no neighbors can see me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Karen, did you have another question or? I had another question and it flew out of my head, so I may raise my hand okay. later. Okay, raise your hand again, yeah. Okay. Uh, there was one question in the chat about the difference between organic and inner and fruits and vegetables that are not organic. I think we know the answer because the uh, inner, the unhealthy ones decrease inflammation. The, uh, <clears throat> can I just say something quickly? Um, the, I mean, there's one theory that organic vegetables have a, a tougher time, have, to have a tough, have a harder environment. So they will make more polyphenols in response to that tougher environment. So there's a benefit in that way. One downside of organic um, fruits and vegetables is in the past, they've used quite toxic uh, pesticides. Uh, rotenone was, was one. Um, I think they stopped that. I think they stopped that two years ago in America. Yeah, they um, did. But uh, I think you could still buy organic 
fruit and veg from another country that still uses it. So just be really careful that when you buy organic foods that um, rotenone has been uh, banned in that country. Otherwise you could be doing self some harm. Rotenone is a, a mitochondrial toxin uh, and has been linked to Parkinson's disease. So um, definitely only buy organic fruit and veg from a country that doesn't use rotenone. Yeah, rotenone is definitely a natural compound to avoid. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit before we take the next question, talk a little bit about um, the impact of sleep? Yeah, um, the impact of sleep. Um, there's, there's a few things there. I mean, melatonin is, is incredibly important for, for mitochondria, for the brain. So it's a powerful antioxidant melatonin that supports mental health as well. Um, also, the uh, that sleep wake cycle, the circadian rhythms are incredibly important for, for the brain to be able to um, connect. There's, there's clock proteins, there's, they're called clock proteins, which can help heal the brain as well. And when we, within the right circadian rhythm, then there's reduced inflammation in the brain. And you see people with depression quite often start shifting their circadian rhythms. They start sleeping later and later and later. Um, and it's, it's like a social jet lag. They get more and more depressed and tired because they're moving, they're losing connection with their natural body clock and that's inflammatory too. Um, so yeah, also something called the glymphatic system. If you heard of the glymphatic system, that when we sleep, uh, the glymphatic system operates um, and it's, a, it's like the lymphatic system of the brain and the brain, when we sleep, spends time releasing lots of waste products um, and particles out of the brain. Um, and this can be really uh, supportive and healing for the brain too. Um, particularly the hippocampus, the hippocampus needs to have, um, it, it needs to have plenty of the brain's lymphatic, the, the, the cerebrospinal fluid flowing around the hippocampus to help uh, nourish it and remove toxins from it. And exercise does that too. Exercise works on the, lymph, the, the lymphatic system. Avantika? Thanks. Hi. Hi, Ray. Thanks for the amazing presentation. Hi. Thank you. Um, so actually, with regard to the glymphatic system, I think this is what was written about in Matthew Walker's book as well, like on why we sleep. Or he talks about some sort of washing process of the brain. I think this was probably it. Um, I just uh, I had a separate question actually on on curcumin because I remember reading about curcumin having a massive effect on BDNF, and I wanted to ask if this was something that was relevant as well. Um, or if you knew about it. And I remember it saying something like what it said on your slide about meditation and how it it had, yeah. uh, it had an effect after like three months or something. So I was wondering if you knew about that. Yeah, um, on the on one of the slides for NRF2, I mean, I think, they, I think it would work at, at several different levels, but one of them, did you see, do you remember the slide of NRF2 with lots of uh, vegetables? It had a, a little bit of turmeric, a pile of turmeric and curcumin on the left-hand side of the slide. And what, what um, curcumin does, it's an inhibitor of NF-kappa B, the inflammatory transcription factor, NF-kappa B. And that helps shift our microglia, these uh, resident immune cells of the brain, towards the um, anti-inflammatory form of microglia. And then these anti-inflammatory form of microglia make BTNF. So it's, it's, that's a bit of a convoluted process but yeah, so by increasing, by, by, sorry, by, by decreasing inflammation, there'll be a, an increase in brain derived neurotrophic factor. Um, so, so yeah, it, it definitely all those polyphenols are really, really good. Is that, is that okay? Have you got any? Avantika? Do you have any questions that I've missed? We're, we're coming up on two hours almost perfectly. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah, if, if, you, if you want to uh, ask a question directly, um, in the reactions button on the bottom right of your screen, they will, if you click on that, you'll see an option for raising your hand. All right, Gilbert, back again. Oh, you need to unmute yourself. 
uh, on the melatonin issue, I started taking some a few weeks ago based on a interview of a doctor that I was watching. And he suggested uh, a dosage much higher than what's normal. Instead of the 3% or three milligrams, I mean, he recommended 10 milligrams. And I can't uh, say enough about uh, what it's done for my sleep pattern after I start taking the 10 milligrams. Okay, thank you. Um, I would also I, ask whether or not you're noticing any morning lethargy. Uh, that's a common problem with people taking um, more melatonin than their body can handle. No, I, no, not, not at all. In fact, I'm, I'm not only sleeping longer periods, but um, much deeper uh, sleep. Uh, and also when I wake up and get up in the morning, I'm feeling great. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Yeah. But I do, I do worry about taking things higher than the recommended amount and, and less there's evidence to back it up. So, I mean, it's good, it's good that you're benefiting, but I, I do have concerns and I, and I like to see, I, I always look at scientific studies to see whether there's um, evidence for, for certain dosages because um, um, I've worked with cancer in the past and so I'm always nervous about being sued for, for, for giving something at too high a dosage. Yeah, I've also, uh, in all of my years of experience in the supplement industry, I think melatonin has the largest dose range of all the supplements where some people, an ideal dose is a tenth of a milligram and other people it's above 10. Okay. So just from that reason, I always ask people to, um, uh, to be wise about melatonin, but yeah. it's, it's very important for mitochondria as an antioxidant. Yeah, it's, it's drawn into the, it's preferentially drawn into mitochondria because it's, it's got such a strong link with it, yes. Mm -hmm. And mitochondria also synthesize melatonin on their own. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. That's, yeah. uh, that's so both ways. Yes. <laughs> Elizabeth. Yay, I've been waiting. Hi, Ray. Thank you Hi. for a truly great talk. It was just epic in my opinion. <laughs> um, I, I have a quick question. I'm pre-diabetic and I can't have fruit except for pomegranate, it seems. Mm. Uh, what can I do to replace those nutrients? How about vegetables? I mean, it's not, it's not just fruit. Vegeta yeah. I eat vegetables all the time. I'm really good there. Yeah, so um, I, I'm not sure about the translation, but do you say cruciferous or brassica? Do you, what do you say for the broccoli, cauliflower, um, that family, kale? Yeah. I say cruciferous, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a nerd. Good to go. It's a lot of that family, the allium family, so all that, so onions, leeks, garlic, allium family. So those those families, the um, uh, squash and uh, you don't you say zucchini, don't you? Yeah. Those families. So I, I tend to look at families and their benefits, but yeah, if you've got problems with fruit, then yeah, there's plenty of plenty of vegetable families and I mean the that broccoli is brilliant for mitochondria the, the sulforaphane that's in broccoli it's really supportive of complex one of mitochondria so that the very start of mitochondria it, it's, it's really important there so just eat plenty of broccoli um yeah uh, so yeah and what about uh coq10 uh supplements for mitochondria what would be the daily dosage of that I, it, it, it depends on the supplement. It can go from very, very low to very high. So with Parkinson's people, it, it, it could be um, up to, I believe it's a, a gram, isn't it? It could be up to up to a gram, but um, it depends on the supplement. It depends what they're in. It depends whether it's uh, ubiquinone or ubiquinol. But the, an important thing to, to recognize is it's only about 3% of CoQ10 supplements are absorbed through the gut. They're not very well absorbed. So you have to take quite high quite high amounts. And even then mitochondria don't absorb it that well themselves. So much of the CoQ10 that we take as a supplement acts as a, uh, a fat soluble antioxidant. It doesn't even make it into mitochondria. So I tend to, with Parkinson's people, I will give them CoQ10 and, and I will usually give them ubiquinone. Um, but um, I will also give them something called MitoQ 
which is um, it's uh, it's not quite CoQ10, but it's like CoQ10, and it's uh, a mitochondrial derived antioxidant. So I give them MitoQ. I'll also make sure I give them vitamin K as well as menaquinone. That vitamin K can act to replace um, CoQ10 in mitochondria. So it's a vitamin K. It's a quinone, menaquinone, ubiquinone. So vitamin K can support. CoQ10, as can plastoquinone um, that's in green vegetables. So green, veg green leafy vegetables are great because they've got vitamin K, which can be used to support mitochondria. They also contain plastoquinone, which is the plant's version of CoQ10 um, used in their chloroplasts. So chloroplasts, when we eat chloroplasts from green leafy vegetables, um, we're also taking on board antioxidants that are supportive for mitochondria because they've got the same evolutionary background. So mitochondria and chloroplast in plants have the same evolutionary backgrounds. And so things that support chloroplast in green leafy vegetables also support mitochondria. So I do that because CoQ10 alone, I don't think is enough because it's poorly absorbed. It's great, but it takes a lot to get it in. And it depends on the, on the formulation of each um, supplement and as I said only 3% gets across the gut anyway so it's a very expensive supplement where 97% doesn't get in. Yeah great thank you very much. Yeah. It's thank you. Any more questions? Um, Irina do you have a question? Okay let me see if I can find you here to ask you to unmute. <coughs> Go ahead. Hello. Uh, yes, my question is again um, about evolution and um, the relationship to uh, grains. Um, do you have any thoughts on how um, the introduction of grains for, into our diet um, impacted mm -hmm. the brain? <clears throat> the and also, it's it's more it's also a wider question about uh, how it actually relates to the way our culture has changed. Mm. The, the biggest one is the effect on the one, the biggest one I know is the, the effect on zonulin. So zonulin for the, for the gut permeability. So the difficulty with gluten or gluten like compounds and the effect on zonulin and how that can uh, increase not just the gut permeability, but the blood brain barrier permeability as well. So for, for many people, the, the grains uh, in terms of gluten can cause the compromise of the, of the gut, which allows for particles within the gut that should be kept in the gut, getting into general circulation, driving inflammation, and also in the brain as well, that can get immune compounds, toxins, and various products which remain out of the brain, getting into the brain as well. Uh, I know other people have talked about these um, uh, morphine opiate type uh, effects as well from gluten as well, um, which can get into the brain and affect the brain, particularly in in autistic children. And milk with some to some degree yeah. as well. Case and, of milk. Uh, can you speak a little bit about um, mitochondrial impairments also manifesting as kind of a um, uh, inefficient digestion? Um, yeah, the definitely the these barriers these. Um, the, the gut gut barrier so the gut permeability we need we need mitochondria in the uh, gut wall to maintain the integrity of the gut wall and if if there's mitochondrial dysfunction within the gut wall then the gut becomes permeable and the blood brain barrier if there's mitochondrial dysfunction then that can lead to blood brain barriers being compromised and I know aluminium is a real mitochondrial toxin and aluminium can cause mitochondrial dysfunction. So things like adjuvants in vaccines might be problematic because of the ability to cause mitochondrial dysfunction. I'm not so um, up on the digestion side of things and mitochondria. I'm not, I'm not it's not something that I've uh, come across and, and, and read about. Mm. 
So, so is it, uh, would you say that um, it has negatively, the grains, um, that grains diet has negatively impacted the evolution of our brains? Um, I think uh, it depends on- There was, yeah. mm -hmm. there was so a, like, an anthropomorphic doctor who said to me that civilization started 10,000 years ago. Um, and that's really the time when civilization started using grains. Yes. So why would you have thought about that? Yeah, I, mean, I think that grains can have a negative effect and positive effect. And, um, particularly oats can be really beneficial. As I said, the, the oats are, are really good at making um, short chain fatty acids, which are really beneficial for the brain, that's soluble fiber. I think there's real problems when you have insoluble fiber, like in, in wheat. And, and it, it probably wasn't so much of a problem in those days because we bred wheat to have more and more gluten to make it more palatable. But that gluten, and if you have more ancient grains with with less gluten in them, I think they're less of a problem. But it's the it's the the loaves we make these days, which are really rich in gluten, which make a really um, nice textured loaf, which are the which are the damaging ones. So I, I think there's lots of levels to that question. But definitely the old wheat, like like Durham wheat, they use for pasta and for for pizza in in Italy. That's a far more digestible wheat it causes far less problems but these really rich in gluten wheats are, are catastrophic for the brain yeah we've also as a civilization more recently learned to refine them yes yes so we had the whole grain and we we, we know that say like in brown rice um we have plenty of antioxidants and b vitamins and brown rice and then you refine the rice and then you lose all those beneficial effects of the rice Mm. Yes, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. We're there. Two hours okay. and seven minutes. Excellent job, everybody. And thank you, Ray. Thank Phenomenal you. information. Thank you so much. I hope you come back and <laughs> give us more information. It was phenomenal. Thank you. That was really, really good fun. I love, I love presenting it and uh, I hope it came across okay. Definitely did. Thank you.